Alright, so Nintendo. A very beloved company by many. Not me though. I don't dislike Nintendo, it's just their games have never found themselves in my hands and I've never really been that into them. I mean, I did own a DS and I have beaten New Soup, but really who hasn't? Those things sold insanely well. The only Nintendo home console I own and have played consistently is the N64. And my most played game on this thing... Are you surprised? The N64 is a very odd and troubled little console. For starters, the amount of software for this thing was tiny, with us Europeans getting only 252 games. This was presumably because of the shift of 3D games making development longer. On top of this, the system used cartridges, which were very expensive and couldn't hold nearly as much data compared to CDs, which did turn a lot of developers away. Lastly, this thing. This, believe it or not, is the controller. However unfit for human hands it may be, I'm about to defend this thing. Using the N64 controller today, yeah, it's odd. Three prongs is such a confusing design choice, you can't access all the buttons at once, which I feel is one of the most fundamental things a controller should nail. The stick feels super flimsy, I'm worried a hardcore Doom 64 session will break this thing. Also, why does this have a D-pad? I don't think I've ever had to use it. Every game I've played so far has made me use the joystick. So, taking into consideration all these things, I don't hate this thing. I mean, the N64 as a whole was the 3D machine. Pretty much all games on this thing were 3D, and the controller was definitely designed with that in mind. At the centre of this oversized, deformed letter M is the analog stick. 3D games have 3D characters which are capable of 360 degrees of movement, and so require something a bit more advanced than a four-way directional pad. Having the stick at the centre means it'll likely be the first thing you see, straight away giving you the impression that you use this thing to play 3D games. The second most prominent feature is the trigger. Yeah, at this point 3D shooters are a bit of a shoo -in. Enter the second piece of this puzzle, Goldeneye. A game that despite the fact I've heard a lot of people say hasn't aged well, I really enjoyed. The graphics leave a lot to be desired, sure, but the game still plays well enough. GoldenEye was a movie tie-in game for guess what movie? Developed by Rare, the creators of Conker and Banjo-Kazooie. Back then, this game was a revolution in the field of console shooters. The game sold insanely well with a total of 8 million copies, making it the third best-selling N64 game, beating both Zelda games on this platform. The reason people went insane over this movie tie-in game was the fact it created a fun first-person console shooter, which sounds trivial nowadays, but before then, there really wasn't anything good in terms of first-person shooters on console, but we'll get more into that later on. And I would argue a very large portion of why people found this game enjoyable over other previous console first-person shooters were the controls. The N64 controller made playing shooters very intuitive, or as intuitive as it could get back then. So it seems that Rare was able to catch lightning in a bottle with this game. But before we continue, we must first rewind a few years. Alright, get ready for a brief history on the evolution of first person shooters. This is definitely oversimplified. Doom was the refinement of Wolfenstein 3D's gameplay which was already established. However, Doom's improvement and popularity was enough to give this game a cult following and the identity of one of the most important games created. Doom may have pioneered the first person shooter, but Wolfenstein 3D was one of the first games like it. And so, for the sake of this video, we're going to say that stage one of the first person shooter was Wolfenstein 3D. Quake releasing in 1996 was stage two, calling out Wolfenstein 3D's lies and actually being 3D. Thanks to our friends 3D rendering and early 3D acceleration making all of these polygons possible. Gone were the very charming sprites and in came the horrifying Lovecraftian polygons. These things are terrifying. The Quake engine is the most important part of all of this as it made it all possible. But the fact I would like to focus on is the fact the engine source code was then released for any programmers to adapt. And adapt it they did. Quite a lot of programmers took to the Quake engine adapting into their own engines. And one of the most prominent of those groups of programmers was Valve, which used their version of the engine to power Half-Life, another pretty influential first-person shooter. The reason I'm telling you all of this is because it's quite possible that a lot of first-person shooters released even this year have just a little of Quake's DNA in it. Also because every single first-person shooter that evolved the genre all came out on PC. It was a PC-only club. This is where GoldenEye returns. This game turned first-person shooters from a PC-only club to a very widely played and enjoyed genre of video games which led the way to eventual oversaturation, overdevelopment and annualization, stealing the perception of standard video game genre from platformers that dominated the 8 and 16-bit era. 
And like mentioned earlier, the impact of this game would be nothing if it wasn't for the thing that you control it with. This is what made this game so popular and work so well. Because it's all well and good having a console that can run these games, but I can almost guarantee, had the controller been designed different, not taken risks, and been more like the competition, GoldenEye wouldn't have made nearly as much of an impact, and the first person shooters would have mostly stayed on PC, similar to RTS games. We wouldn't have gotten a new Call of Duty each year, Wait, that's a bad thing? Platformers would most likely still remain the most popular thing and eventually reach oversaturation similar to first person shooters. So in the timeline that this thing didn't exist, instead of an annual Call of Duty, there would be an annual platformer. And really from that point, there is no telling what the gaming landscape would look like today. I mean, for one, I wouldn't have played Doom Eternal, which I, yeah, it's, that's a really bad thing. 